everybody. I'm going to share my screen. How are we doing this morning? Let's see, I need to see my chat. Okay. Oh, we got a thumbs up. Feeling good on a Monday. All right. You got what? Well, I like the hair too. Thank you. So good, good. Hey, Ross. All right. Good morning. All right. So I think we're almost ready to get started. Good morning, Diana. Dana. Good morning. Good morning. It's pronounced Dania. So I, I have to confess to a few boo boos before we start. <laughs> All right. So uh, I did not have the chapter two lecture slides up until like two minutes ago. So if you would like to go ahead and go and get those right now. You can go ahead and get those right now. And on my pre recorded um, lectures, so how did I have that before? Oh, I put it on the same page here. So if you go here, this is going to take you to the entire playlist for all of the chapters for all of the sections. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to post one link like in the very beginning somewhere, maybe up here by the syllabus or right up here, right, right under announcements so that you can go to one link and it'll take you to that playlist and that'll be all the videos. That way I'm not posting a link for every single chapter videos. Does that sound better? So I, this is the first time I use Moodle. If you know of a better way to do something in Moodle, please tell me. <laughs> I will take any and all suggestions. Okay. So, that's that. So let's do an attendance real quick, real quick. If I can minimize this, right? We can close this. All right. And I do not see my flash drive. Of course, of course, of course. Let's see. There we go. So we're going to do our real quick eye clicker attendance. So I'm going to minimize this. I could go to slideshow. This will work. And I know. Here we go. All right. Oh, here we go. So check in for attendance. I am either A present or B remote. So I'll leave that run for a second. What I also wanted to tell y'all is I went in and I made some comments on our discussion that we were doing. You remember the Excel spreadsheet? Let's see. So over here, I did not get to the discussion part one, but I did work on the discussion part two so that you can see my comments. If you go here. I need to change this view. How do I change this view? Here we go. Let's do that. Make it small. Okay. So if you scroll over, I highlighted a column and I put some comments for each one. So if you want to take a look at those and you want to see um, what I suggested and that kind of thing, you can. And I did the same thing. Oh, and we got somebody something in the chat. BB. Okay, good. Thank you guys. Uh, 
And if you look on the last one, I also have comments here. So, and whoever figured out how to insert the picture that they drew, that's awesome. So you definitely get brownie points, whoever did that. I don't know who that was, but thank you. That's awesome. Okay, so any questions on that? I'll go in and try and do part one of the discussion um, today. Things just got, uh, oh, Grace, thank you, Grace. That's awesome. Good job. Very nice. All right, uh, it got kind of crazy. So the reason you don't, you didn't have anything to actually watch today before class is because, I'm learning all this stuff, all right, closing all this stuff is because the first section in chapter two is huge. The first section is huge. Don't forget to get a wipe, you guys. And it was a 40, I recorded it. I think it was ended up being like 50 minutes long. So I didn't want y'all to have to watch the entire 50 minutes long in one setting. I was like, oh, that's just too much. So we're gonna start it today. And whatever we don't finish today, you'll watch. And, um, and then section two is even shorter. And then section four, I think is like seven minutes long. So it's nice and sweet and to the point in that last section. So it should be pretty good. Make sure y'all who are just coming in that you go ahead and check in on um, the iClicker app, okay? And if somebody would just kind of keep an eye on the chat for me so that I don't miss somebody saying something, I'd appreciate that. All right, any questions, anything I missed, anything? Yes, so this is the one I just showed you. If you go, maybe, maybe I can get out of here. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, so here, if you go to Moodle and go to chapter two, I said it wasn't up before, this was my fault. It wasn't up before, but I went ahead and put it up right now. If y'all ever notice that, please, please, please tell me. You can either send me an email or, uh, you can come up here to this general course questions form and you can take me in a question right there. Hey, Dr. B, where are the slides for chapter two? That's tomorrow. <laughs> I promise I will put them in and then everybody will see that you asked the question and then that, okay, I, I have it posted and I'll show you where it's at. Okay, so please, please make use of this um, general course questions. I'm not perfect. I admit it. I'm not perfect, um, but we'll struggle together, all right? All right, so let's go back here. So we're actually gonna start on chapter two. So any questions on chapter one, actually, before we start chapter two? Everybody good? Awesome, I feel like we're making progress. I feel like we're doing great. Okay, so uh, chapter two. We're gonna talk about three big things. We're gonna talk about energy conversion. So when we talk about energy conversion, the scientific term for energy conversion is bio, energetics, bioenergetics, right? How that happens in general, and then we're gonna apply it specifically to biological systems. And it's a little bit different within a biological system, so you have to be kind of careful. We're gonna talk a lot about water. We're gonna talk about water's non-covalent interactions, even though they call it a bond, it's not really a bond. We're gonna talk about the pH, the pKa, buffers. So that's gonna be kind of a general chemistry reminder for you all. Then we're going to talk briefly about how cell membranes function, but that's kind of a very small portion of the chapter. So are y'all okay if I close the clicker? Everybody checked in? Okay, so let me close this so that it gets small and it's not in our way anymore. Okay, if you, if you, need, if you need to check in or something like that, you can use the chat in Zoom. All right, so um, where do we see energy conversion, right? Let's start kind of at the beginning of the process. If you want to convert energy, where do we get all of our energy from? Sunlight, sunlight. We, we have um, hydrogen that undergoes fusion, right, into helium. And then what happens when that fusion reaction occurs? We have a release of EM radiation, including light, and that light is what plants use to photosynthesize, right? So in order to transform that solar energy into chemical energy, we have to talk about energy conversion or bioenergetics. 
So the normal laws that apply, apply here as well. Laws of thermodynamics. We're going to talk about the first two. And then we're going to talk about exergonic and endergonic reactions and how we couple them inside of the body to make metabolism work. Because guess what? A lot of these reactions in the body, they don't work so well. They take a lot of energy to do. So we have to figure out a way to make that possible inside of the cell, to make it favorable to happen. And so we're gonna talk about how we do that. And then we're gonna talk about the adenylate system. What is the adenylate system? Are you having ideas? If we talk about energy, what is the energy currency of the cell? ATP. So it's not just ATP. If you're gonna have ATP, what must you also have in the cell? What happens when you cleave ATP? You get a ADP, sorry. And then if you cleave ADP, you get AMP, okay? So that's our, that's our adenylate system. this over here. Okay, so bioenergetics is energy conversion. Now, does, does every organism do photosynthesis? No, we don't do photosynthesis. That'd be cool, but we'd be green. Um, <laughs> so we have to worry about energy conversion between biomolecules. So how about plants? Do plants have to worry about that? Yes, they do. Yes, they do. At night, they sure do. They absolutely do. Right? Um, so in photosynthesis, you can transform that solar energy, but at night, you're not getting solar energy. So plants also have to worry about chemical energy being interconverted between molecules. And how do we do that? We do that with redox reactions. So oxidation reduction reactions, right? So we use that as, we use the, the chemical intermediates as um, metabolic fuel so that we can drive things like aerobic respiration, right? So we need that energy. So why do we need chemical energy? Well, we need to be able to perform work, but what do we mean when we say work? When I think of work, I think of like cleaning my house, that's work, you know? But that's not what we think about with the cell. What's work in the cell? Whatever your, whatever your normal function is, so you need to create some biomolecules in order to perform those functions, right? And then they actually have to operate. So you're, you're using up energy to do those kinds of things, right? And so where are we getting that chemical energy? We're getting it from the environment. Plants can get it from sunlight. We get it from consuming things that other organisms have made, right? Okay, so let's look at our examples of work. So what we talked about whoa, is the chemical, right? We talked about biosynthesis of molecules, but we also have to think about degradation, right? If you eat a hamburger, how are you going to use that hamburger to fuel something? Well, you have to break it down. So you have to worry about degradation just as much as biosynthesis. We also have to talk about work in terms of osmotic regulation. So we don't want to necessarily pump water in and out of the cells depending on what's going on in the environment. So we have to maintain a certain concentration of solutes on the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell to make sure that we maintain the right water pressure on the inside, right? Because what happens if the water pressure gets too high? What's gonna to happen to the cell? It's gonna kind of like blow up, right? What's gonna happen if the, if the pressure gets too low, if you don't have enough water? going to shrivel up, right? Either way is not good. Either way, you're going to have some serious problems. So there's osmotic uh, work, there's chemical work, and then there's mechanical work. So this is what I, I think we mostly think about when we think about work, right? Walking from one place to another place. You're doing physical work, mechanical work. And so you predominantly see that in muscle contraction inside of um, animals. So Here's our different types of energy, right? Ooh. We start with solar energy. We start with that fusion. We release our electromagnetic radiation. 
um, are photosynthetic plants and algae. It's not just plants, it's also algae in the oceans, right? That convert that solar energy into chemical energy. Then we can use it for osmotic work, chemical work, and, and mechanical work, okay? So we spend a lot of energy worried about homeostasis. When you see homeostasis, does homeostasis mean we're at equilibrium? Absolutely not. So put yourself a big not equals. If you're at equilibrium, then all the macromolecules tend to equilibrate to their surroundings, right? So then we have equal concentrations. If we have equal concentrations of things. Could we have a membrane potential? I know about membrane potentials. Yeah, so that it's not going to exist. If, if we are at equilibrium, guess what? We are dead. We're dead. It's terrible, right? We want to maintain our homeostasis. So we have to worry about maintaining a certain temperature. We have to worry about maintaining a certain concentration of biomolecules inside of our cells. And to do that, you're going to expend a lot of energy, right? So this is the fundamental reason why all living organisms need our input of in energy is to maintain homeostasis. So this is fundamental reason for energy needs. I'm not very good at writing with this pen. <laughs> I'll try to get better. So we, it, because we don't want to be at equilibrium, we want to be at homeostasis. So how do we do that? How do we transfer energy? We're doing redox reactions, redox reactions. Tell me what's the basics of a redox reaction? What are we transferring? Electrons, so this is electron transfer from a high electrochemical to a molecule with low electrochemical. PHEM chemical properties, right? So usually it's not just one transfer, usually it's a sequence. So it's a series of linked reactions so that we can transfer that, those electrons sequentially. And so in, the pro, in, the, in that process, right, we're gonna generate energy and we're gonna be able to use that energy inside of the cell. Um, so let's look, at, let's look at an example. When I accidentally click it, it doesn't go. When you want it to go, it doesn't go, right? So remember your difference between oxidation and reduction. Reduction means a gain of electrons. Oxidation is a loss of electrons. But when you're looking at the molecules, one thing that you can look at is you can look at your hydrogens. So look, for example, here we have C6H12O6. What do we got? Glucose, sugar. Right, so what are we gonna do with this sugar? What process are you looking at down there? Respiration, right, respiration. So we're starting with a carbon source, glucose, and we're converting it to carbon dioxide. What happened? We still have carbons, we still have oxygens. What happened to our hydrogens? We're changing our number of hydrogens, right? How about our electrons? What happens to our electrons? We have 24 here in our glucose. What happened down here in carbon dioxide? We don't have any more. What did we do with them? We transferred them, right? We transferred them. And look what happens. They keep getting transferred. Okay, so that's how oxidation reduction reactions work. And we're going to go into those specific pathways into insanely um, high levels of detail, but you don't have to do, do that right now. You just have to remember that these electrons are not, so the electrons are not free in solution. 
right? They're not free in solution. They're, they're actually associated with molecules. They get transferred from one molecule to another. So you're not going to have free electrons. They're going to be transferred. Okay. So if we want to understand how chemical reactions work inside the cell, we have to do a quick refresher on um, our thermodynamics, on, on how um, the system and the surroundings work, right? So basic definition of the system, it's a collection of matter in any, any given defined space. So it could be a solution inside of a test tube, right? You have a reaction going on inside of a test tube. Is that the kind of system we're going to talk about? Not so much. <laughs> we're going to talk about maybe what's going on inside the cell or maybe even what's going on in the whole organism, right? So you can define the system as anything you want it to be. And then the surroundings are just anything that's not included in the system. So what do you get when you add the system plus the surroundings? What do you get? No? The universe? Right? The universe? Because you have to understand that there's a relationship between the system and the surroundings. Okay, so what kind of systems do we have? We have open, closed, and isolated. If you're open, you have constant exchange of matter and energy, constantly going back and forth. Closed, you only have energy exchanged, no matter. And then in an isolated, you have no matter and no energy exchanged. So what kind of system do you think we're going to have in biochemistry? We are definitely going to have an open system. We're going to have an open system. So this is all biological systems. What are we exchanging in terms of matter? How could we define that? What kind of matter do we exchange? Gas exchange, but like, why do you want to exchange gases? What's the point? Right, so you need, there, there are some requirements, right? So um, you could say your, your matter or your nutrients, right? Your needed materials. You could call that like O2, right? You need that to survive. Um, what else are you going to exchange? What other kind of matter? Things we need and what else do we have to do? Get rid of stuff. We have waste products that we have to get rid of. And if you don't get rid of those waste products, trust me, your cell's not gonna last very long. How about energy? What do we exchange in terms of energy? So the word for energy. Well, we're not really going to exchange ATP with the surroundings. We want to keep our ATP. But a lot of times when we do reactions inside of the cell, there's something that gets let off. Heat. Heat. Heat is exchanged very freely with our surroundings. Very, very freely. Occurs all the time. Right? Okay. So, as a biochemist, we're going to use two of our laws, the first and second laws of thermodynamics. So let's cover the first one first. Um, we know that the total amount of, the, of energy in the universe is constant. Because that's true, we cannot create or destroy energy. We are not that powerful. We can't do it. It'd be cool, but we can't. <laughs> It'd be really cool, but we can't, right? So we know that energy can be converted. Right? And we can calculate the change in energy in a system, final minus initial, right? Um, but we also know the definition of energy. What, what two things do we talk about when we talk about energy? What could delta E also equal? Go back and remember chem, heat and work. You remember that? I know this is like, this is like pulling from the dredges of like your very first or second semester chemistry, right? Some of these things are looking familiar. Yes. 
sometimes you just need that refresher. Okay, so our, our energy change here, right, is equal to the difference between our heat and our work. What is work due to? In basic chemistry, I'm not talking about biological systems, basic chemistry. And I'm not even looking at my chat. I'm so sorry, y'all. Put it down. So look, they were even, they were even answering. Oh, I can put it right there and I can see. This is awesome. Pressure and volume. Pressure and volume. But gosh, in a living cell, are we going to have a lot of volume change? Or a lot of pressure change? Not really. So, so that's not going to be a big, um, a big involvement in our energy changes. So whenever we, um, whenever we do this, right, we're going to look at delta H. What does H stand for? Enthalpy. Enthalpy. So that's our heat content. So this is where we're going to see a lot of um, our energy change in the system is enthalpy, right? So this is our, our, our heat content of any given system. And we can look at that in terms of change in energy plus our change in pressure and volume, but we're really not gonna see a whole lot of that. So let's say we're in biological conditions, right? So if we're biological, right, our pressure, our delta P is gonna be zero and our delta V is gonna be zero. That's what we're kind of assuming. So what if we combine our two equations here? Can we do that, assuming that these two factors are zero? So if we did delta E is equal to, so we'll say delta H minus delta pressure times volume, which is Q, oh, it's not plus, y'all, minus, minus work. Get my formulas right. So our work is really what? Zero, right? Our pressure and volume is really zero. So what can we say? I'm gonna come over here and squeeze it in. Delta E is equal to delta H, which is equal to Q. So our change in energy is gonna be due to heat. So if we're going to be talking about heat, we need to talk more about enthalpy. Okay, so this is, um, so what we also need to talk about, if we're going to talk about enthalpy, is we need to talk about entropy. So this is our second law of thermodynamics. Um, and you have to remember that the universe tends towards disorder. I will give you an example my eight-year-old <laughs> my eight-year-old tends towards disorder so um there's one way for his room to be clean but there are infinite ways for his room to not be clean right and so it tends towards being not clean <laughs> so um you can think about this in biological systems like um if you have a big macromolecule, right? That big macromolecule is, is not gonna have a lot of entropy. But if we break it down into a bunch of little pieces that can move around, that can do a bunch of different things, now we're gonna have more entropy, right? So the universe tends towards those smaller molecules with more movement, with more entropy inside of them, okay? So when we talk about entropy, we're talking about S, that's our abbreviation for it. So you have to remember in biological systems that the conversion of energy, all those stepwise processes that we were talking about, right? You're going to lose heat in every single one of those steps. So you're constantly going to be losing, losing heat. So they're less, we'll say less than 100% efficient because of heat. So you have energy that's lost due to heat that you can't use for work. So you could look at any given chemical reaction and you could say, okay, here's the, 
here's the, the change in energy for that reaction, and I want to know if it's spontaneous or not. Well, if all you know is the potential inside of those bonds, you can't make that decision because you don't know how much heat is being lost. You don't know basically the whole story. So what we're gonna to learn today is how to figure out the whole story. So we remember our basic definitions for exothermic and endothermic reactions. Yes, some head nodding, maybe. <laughs> So big remember, right? Exothermic is going to release heat. That is a negative delta H. This was my uh, savior when I was up in Iowa. I used to go to the football games. And let me tell you, they were outside. They were outside. And it was cold. So we got the hot hands. We don't use hot hands down here. It's Louisiana. We have hot hands all the time, right? But it's a little pack. And when you break it, the two, the two packs of chemicals mix. And then it gets warm. Yeah, if you have an injury or something like that, that's more likely what we're going to use down here. Um, but I used to put them one in each shoe and then one in each pocket inside of my coat pocket because it was so cold, right? Uh, the opposite is endothermic, right? This is where you're absorbing heat from the environment. So you have a delta H that is positive, right? So if you Put out, put out energy to keep warm. I'm gonna pick up my jacket, I'm gonna put my jacket on. Um, I had to use up energy in order to do that, to stay warm, right? Okay, so, oh, and don't forget um, our units, right? When we talk about energy, we talk about joules, but that's not the only unit. What, what other unit do we use? I've done this before, right? A while ago. <laughs> well, it's good that we're doing a refresher. Um, what about the energy of when you have a snack? How do we count that? Calories, calories. but guess what? Y'all know that there are two different kinds of calories, right? There's the big C calories, and then there's calories. Who did that? Who did that? That's terrible. That's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to know that one big calorie, right, is a thousand calories. So the big C is a nutritional calorie, and then the, the little C are the energy calories. And then we know that 4.184 joules is equal to, right, one little calorie. So you have to remember your units. Okay. All right, so let's talk about entropy a little more. We said entropy is our measure of disorder, remember that's S. And so it increases when you have more dispersal of energy. And this is what I was talking about with those big molecules. If you have one big molecule, how much can that one big molecule rearrange? How much can it move? You can move the whole thing, it can tumble, it can vibrate, that sort of thing. But what happens if we break it down into a bunch of little pieces? Now they can orient themselves differently compared to all those other pieces. They can move, they can tumble. So which one has more dispersal of energy? The small molecules, the small molecules. Oh, y'all are awesome. Taylor, thank you for helping out Courtney. And it's a four point, 4.184, 4. that's a decimal point. Okay. okay, even though you can't really tell it's a decimal point, right? Okay, so if you understand the potential energy inside the bonds and you understand entropy, then you can start to look at a complete biological system. But let's start with something a little more simple. So I'm going to ask you a question. Why does ice melt at room temperature? What does it have to do with? It's all about entropy, right? Water's pretty cool. Water's pretty special. special. We're going to talk about water. But whenever you have molecules that are in this solid phase within water, because of all those hydrogen bonds, they are in a super highly ordered state. So this is highly ordered. 
right? What kind of um, mo motion do they have? Not very much. So this will just say low motion or motational energy, however you want to say that, right? Now what happens when it melts? Are we highly ordered? No, this is, this is, this is not ordered. You actually have hydrogen bonds that we know are held together, right, in the solid form. And you also have hydrogen bonds in the liquid form, but they are made and broken, made and broken, made and broken all the time, all the time, right? So it's not stuck in one conformation, one highly ordered state. And so when you talk about what's more favorable, you have to think about enthalpy, which is H, and you have to think about entropy, which is S. All right, you have to consider both. So how do we consider both? We have an equation for that. We have an equation for everything, right? <laughs> so our difference between our enthalpy and our entropy at a given temperature is called Gibbs free energy. Can we measure Gibbs free energy at any point? Can we just measure it? No, but what we can do is have a system at two different conditions and measure the change, right? So, so that formula, you just add your deltas. Well, it's not delta T, it's delta S. Come on, can I erase? Yeah. Okay. So we know at equilibrium, our delta G is equal to zero. So that tells us that in any pathway, in any chemical reaction that's happening, that we're making the same amount of products and reactants. Does that mean that the reaction has stopped? No, you're constantly making products and you're constantly making reactants. It's just that the concentrations of the two are equal. So be careful with that. So when we look at this, when we look at Gibbs free energy, this is where we look at delta G and we're going to determine, is this an exergonic or an endergonic reaction? So if it's exergonic, we're going to have a delta G that's less than zero. So in this case, your reaction, you know, A plus B goes to AB, is going to proceed in the forward direction. So the reaction is favorable and spontaneous. If our Gibbs free energy is less than one, and we have this same reaction, so if it is less than one, what's gonna happen is we're gonna see the reverse happen, the reverse reaction. So this forward reaction is gonna be unfavorable and non-spontaneous. So we use this a lot in biochemistry when we're comparing different chemical reactions under set conditions. So remember, that's what the little knot, this little circle right here tells us, is that we're at standard conditions. So this is standard free energy change. So you put the little circle, right? So our standard conditions, you should know your standard conditions, 1 atm, room temperature, but you're going to give it to me in Kelvin. And it's really, 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 really important to be in Kelvin. Because if not, all your calculations will be crazy because you'll have some negative numbers and that's, that's not going to work. And then your reactants and your products are at one molar. So that's the standard. But you know, there's actually even a um, much uh, more controlled set of standards inside of biological systems. And so we say delta G not, and we put a little hashtag, not a hashtag, what do you call that? A little, a what? <laughs> There's a name for it. There's a name for it, but a little dash. Not a, I guess, yeah, it's like an apostrophe, but it's like up higher because it's a, it's a superscript. But yeah, y'all know what I mean, okay? So this is in a biological system. So this tells your, your biological. A prime. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we also have to have a, an additional set of conditions on that. 
So what's our pH in biological systems typically? Seven, pH is seven. We also have to worry about our concentration of water. Our concentration of water is typically 55.5 molar. And then we also, if magnesium is present, it's such a big, whoa, magnesium is present, it's such an important ion um, that is at one millimolar. If it's present, it's not always present, but if it's present. So using these formulas, right, we can determine if a reaction is spontaneous or not. And your textbook has um, a nice little table I think I put that in here for you. A nice little table that tells you if it's going to be spontaneous or not. And this is really important to understand, but I hate memorizing tables and stuff like that, right? It's just not my cup of tea. So I like to think about it mathematically. That makes sense to me. So either one of these is fine, but I did my own little thing and I put this slide in there for you so that you could kind of see. But there are four different possibilities that could happen. The reaction could be spontaneous no matter what the temperature is. So regardless of the temperature, it's spontaneous. Or it could never be spontaneous. Does not matter how hot or how cold it gets, it will never be spontaneous. Or it could depend on temperature. So sometimes when the temperature is larger or smaller, then you will become spontaneous. So how do you know? You just have to plug it into the formula and look at signs and you can figure it out. I hate memorizing a chart and I gave you this, I gave you this, this is my own handwritten um, craziness, but so let's talk about the four possibilities, right? The things that are going to change your spontaneity of a reaction are delta H and delta S, right? So our four combinations are whether you're endothermic or exothermic. So remember you're exothermic, you're negative delta H, endothermic is positive. So what happens if you have an exothermic reaction with a high level of um, entropy, right? So what if delta H is negative? Now look at your signs. You're subtracting, let's say, that the temperature is going to be positive because we're in Kelvin. So temperature is always going to be positive. So we'll give that a positive sign. And then look at delta S. If we have a high degree, we're going to be positive. So a negative times a positive times a positive gives you a negative. So anytime you add two negative values together, it doesn't matter what they are. What are you going to get for delta G? Negative. What does a negative delta G tell you? It will be what? To be spontaneous, you must be negative delta G. So guess what? In this set of conditions, you will always be spontaneous, right? Okay, Ooh. can I move this down? I'll move it up, okay. So let's look at the opposite of that. What if we have an endothermic, but it has a low delta S? Well, I want delta G to be negative, right? I want that to be spontaneous. But if I'm endothermic, what's my charge on delta H? Positive, right? Minus, this is gonna be a positive number. Delta S is going to be a negative if we have a low, a low amount of disorder. So we'll have a positive plus a positive. Can you add two positive numbers and get a negative? Not gonna happen, so it's never gonna be spontaneous. These other two conditions depend on the temperature. If the temperature um, here gets low, then that's going to make this positive value bigger than this negative value, and you'll get, um, and you'll get a del negative delta G, and vice versa. So if you understand the mathematics, you don't have to memorize the chart. It's up to you, okay? All right, so now we need to talk about delta G and K. Can we make this smaller? I, I feel like, how do you make this go away? <laughs> Is that a thing? Hide, hide floating meeting controls. Yay, okay. All right, so the relationship between our free energy and our equilibrium. This is really, really important when we talk about how reactions proceed. So this is, I call this my, um, I call this the rat link equation. Right, R, T, L, N, a K, rat link, 
that's how I remember it. So our Gibbs free energy is directly related to equilibrium. So we're given a basic equation here. We have reactants going into products. We can write an equilibrium expression. Remember your equilibrium expression are your concentrations at equilibrium of the products over the concentration of the reactants. Yes, we remember this? Okay. <laughs> so when we plug this in, if our K here is less than one, we're gonna favor the formation of the reactants. Does that make sense? Right, if K is our products over our reactants, if K becomes less than one, we're gonna favor our reactants. So this, this um, denominator is gonna be really big and that's gonna make K less than one, right? So that's this one. So if you do the other side, right? K, it's still products over reactants. If K is greater than one, then that means we're favoring the products. So we're making lots of products, so our numerator is gonna be bigger than our denominator, right? And if K is one, then they're equal. So the reaction's really at equilibrium, yeah? Okay, so now we're gonna move on. We're gonna talk about actual free energy, all this stuff that we've done. We finally get to kind of biological systems. So we said biological systems are not at our standard conditions, right? And so we know our actual free energy, right? Our actual free energy is delta G. And that is our delta G naught plus RT ln Q. What is Q? It's not K, but it's really similar to K. I call it the wannabe K. Q really, really wants to be K, but it's not. These are the initial concentrations. So the concentrations at any given set of conditions, right? Are your cells at equilibrium? No, no. So they're gonna, your cells are gonna be at Q. They're not really gonna be at K. So what we really care about is Q. Right? So when, the reaction does get to equilibrium, then that would mean our delta G is zero. So then we can solve for this um, standard Gibbs free energy, but we're not gonna be, we're really gonna be dealing with Q. Q is gonna be our go-to, all right? Okay, so we already said this, right? The conditions at standard free energy um, are the same, but when we're in a biological system, our three things we have to also worry about are pH or seven, our concentration of water, and our concentration of Mg2+. Plus. That should be a concentration, right? Concentration, okay? We already said that though. All right, so how do we make it work? Remember we said at the very beginning of all this that um, not all reactions go spontaneously, right? And a lot of those that are biological don't happen spontaneously. So that reaction is endergonic. What are you going to do? You still need to do whatever cellular function. So what you do is you couple a energetically unfavorable reaction with an energetically favorable one. And so the way that we do this in the cell is we um, couple ATP hydrolysis to lots and lots of different things. And when we couple those, we can look at the overall change in energy. And if the overall change in energy of those coupled reactions is enough, then that reaction will go, okay? The, the other thing that ATP can do, it's not, that's not the only way ATP works. ATP can also change um, the conformation of proteins, and I'll show you some examples of that. But when you're doing this kind of a coupled reaction, you have to go back and remember your basic chemistry where you're adding equations. Do you remember adding? equations and making a goal equation, right? So here's our example, right? We have A plus B goes to C. Now this C is gonna be used as a reactant in our second, why did it do that? In our second reaction. So what do we call something that is a product in the first reaction and a reactant in the second? What do we call that? Anybody? An intermediate. I didn't know you were going to be quizzed today. <laughs> right? An intermediate. This is why it works. 
you must, the two reactions must share an intermediate. If they don't share an intermediate, they're not coupled. So if we look at our net reaction, right, what happens to C? It cancels out and we don't see it in the net reaction. That's the definition of an intermediate. So because they're coupled, we can now add our delta G's, get delta G for the third, for the net reaction, and we see that it's exergonic. So this reaction is gonna go. This one is, is not happening, right? ATP hydrolysis, or whatever it is that you're coupling, is great. You just want a net overall where we have a delta G that's negative. Then it's spontaneous and it will go, right? All right. Um, let's see, what else do I want to, oh, so how do you know, thinking about it just chemically, how do you know that an intermediate is going to make these coupled reactions go? Think about shifts of, of, of reactions. So if C is an intermediate, right, if, if C is used in reaction two, right, it reacts with D, what happens to the concentration of C? So then we have a decrease in the concentration of C. If you have a decrease in the concentration of, she, of C, what happens to the shift of the reaction? We're gonna shift to products, right? Because the, the reaction is always gonna shift such that you balance out whatever's changing. So we're changing, we're decreasing the concentration of C, so we wanna shift the reaction to then re-increase our concentration of C, right? Remember that? So that's why it works, it's really cool. So when you look at, this is our structure of ATP, when we look at the different bonds that we can break, we're gonna talk about the different phosphates. So the phosphate that is closest to the ribose is the alpha phosphate, then you have the beta phosphate, then you have the gamma phosphate, okay? So when we look at that hydrolysis, if we have one hydrolysis event and we cleave right here, what are we gonna make? PI and ADP, right? So that's the cleavage at the gamma phosphate. So for the hydrolysis at gamma phosphate, we have a delta G of negative 30.5. Each place where we have a hydrolysis, we have a different delta G. So if we cleave here, right, we're going to make another inorganic phosphate, and we're going to make what? Adenosine monophosphate, right? The D is for di, the M is for mono, mono meaning one, yeah. Like, I don't, with these masks on, it's really hard for me to tell how we're doing. All right, so how are we gonna do this? Here's an example. This is an example of an actual biological system where we, um, we use the hydrolysis of ATP in order to increase that activity, right? So we have glutamate and we wanna make glutamine. Is this an energetically favorable reaction? Nope, nope, nope. So we need to couple it to something. So we're gonna couple it to ATP hydrolysis. But what's really interesting is that it's not the actual hydrolysis that catalyzes the reaction. It's actually the transfer of this phosphate group onto the substrate to create a high energy intermediate. Then you can use glutamate synthase and put what you really want in that place. So it's actually the creation of this intermediate that makes this whole process work, that makes it energetically favorable. Okay, so I think we're, have we got two minutes? I think this is a good stopping point. Um, so you have the rest of, for homework tonight, you have the rest of section one, which we did, we did pretty good. We, we're almost done, we're really almost done. And then you have section two, to watch, the lectures to watch for Wednesday, because we have an activity on Wednesday and we have an activity on Friday, okay? Any questions, good? Yay. Okay. All right, anybody at home have any questions? Can you please post the lecture slides and please 
Um, yes, so I will post the, the lecture recording in just a minute. And I did post the slides. If you go to, let me show you real quick. If I can get out of this. I'm going to discard that. Hang on, I'm going to show them where this is. So if you go to Moodle and you go here, chapter two lecture slides. Okay? And it should pull them up. It should pull up. Yeah, handouts of them. Cool? Okay, post a question if anybody else has a question. Great. I just got an email from Dr. Kamani. Is it okay if I just sit with Monday? Because that's when my lab day is. So I that's we'll do it all on one day. Perfectly fine with me. Okay, perfectly thank you fine. So much. Monday, I'm going to write that down. Okay. Yeah. And do they have the annotations? No, they do not have the annotations. And I just discarded the annotations. You can ask me this. Okay, ask me. Um, whenever you have like in a cell, say if you had LG, LG not. standard or yeah. not, whatever. Oh, yeah. um, what's like the distinction between those two? Like, well, you're you're not necessarily going to be at standard conditions. Mm -hmm. So, so delta G is the actual, what's actually happening inside the cell. Mm -hmm. Delta G naught is like a test tube. Oh, uh, like the ideal? Yeah, That's yeah, it. yeah, like the ideal conditions so that like never really happen. Okay. So, like, there's two different values from those. Okay. Yes, uh, yes. Like, because the, 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 the environment that you're in changes the conditions, changes mm -hmm. how the reaction proceeds, mm -hmm. right? So, so, you have to take that into account if you really want to know if this reaction is going to happen. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, do, okay. If anybody has um, where they wrote down what I was writing and they want to send it to me, I'll post it to everybody because I was late on um, on posting the uh, the uh, the actual slides. So if anybody wants to be super nice to somebody in the class and y'all downloaded the slides beforehand and copied my annotations down uh, because I already cleared mine, I will post them to the group forum. I don't know how many people are still on to hear that, but let's see how many people are still on. Nine. That? Nine people heard that. <laughs> All right. Y'all got a question? No, we're not even in this class. Oh, you're not even in this class. No, we're not. Sorry. No, it's okay. All right. Can I repeat that? Yes. So, so Christian was asking um, if the slides that I posted to Moodle has the annotations that I made in class today. And the answer to that is no, because I closed out of the PowerPoint and I cleared my annotations. So um, because I didn't post the slides until right before class, that was my fault. If someone wrote the annotations on my, on my handout, on this handout back here, and they want to share it with people in the class, if you send it to me, I'll post it in the forum. Or if somebody can just post it on the forum, skip me, skip the middleman. Does that make sense? Jennifer did that? Okay, good, good. All right, I will try to be better. If you notice something that's missing on Moodle, please just tell me. I make mistakes, please tell me, I'll fix it, I promise. All right, if y'all don't need anything else, I'm going to go ahead and close this and save this recording. If I can find, here we go.